Here we are. Hello and welcome to Men's Corner. I'm here sitting with my friend John Fontaine again. Good to have you here, John. George, welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me back. Uh, I had a blast the last time when we did Roots and Story. And uh, so I am really excited and, and privileged to have gotten the invitation from you. And I'm just filled with joy to be here today to talk about something different. What are we going to talk about, George? Yeah, well, that's a promise that uh, we've kept. We're going to talk about film and story this time. Story through film. So um, without any further explanation, because I haven't got any, I'm just following what you know, we think is right. What is film to you? What is meant to, to you through your life, throughout your life? Uh, that, good question to start. I was thinking about this this morning and I was thinking in terms of the very first film I saw on two mediums. Uh, and this was going back to, to my Bronx tale we talked about in the last podcast as a young boy. But one medium was on television. I remember I must have been about six or seven years old and my mother sat me down in front of the television in our Bronx apartment and asked me to watch a film. And that film was West Side Story, the musical. Mm. Uh, I was blown away by it because it was set in the Bronx. Yes. So there was an instant connection to that. And I was just fascinated by the combination of, of what I remember in the rear view as a man now of, of the images and the music and the story. So that was on television, on, on the smaller screen. The very, I was thinking back in my story today, the very first film I saw in a movie theater in New York City as a small boy was the film Chisholm with John Wayne, the Western. And that was epic. So on the big screen in Panavision, um, just seeing that story of, of men in battle against each other, sort of good versus evil, uh, the, the good battle, uh, good cattle baron played by John Wayne uh, versus the enemies in the story. And there was a bit of romance in there, adventure, you know, danger. So I, I remember that impacting me a lot. And then films for me um, have been around since childhood. I, I, I found them fascinating in, um, what they brought to me in terms of story, how they told me a story. And I, I never feel like I'm escaping my reality when I'm watching a film. I always feel like I'm being drawn in to a story that speaks to my reality. Wow, that's amazing. I love West Side Story. Did you know any, um, any of that type of character, like the Hispanics and the, because you grew up in the Bronx. Yeah, the Jets and the Sharks. I mean, obviously <laughs> growing up in New York City in the Bronx, um, very melting pot, obviously cliche, but true. Just all the cultures, uh, Black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Salvadorian, Puerto Rican, American, Irish, German, all of that, just all cultures mixed together. So, it, was, it wasn't really an exaggeration of street gangs because even as a small boy, I knew street gangs existed within our neighborhood, within the Bronx, within New York City. You, you, you would know them. I knew, I knew people in them. I, I knew associations with them. So it was kind of fascinating to see that movie first and then see the reality of knowing, hey, there are street gangs outside of my apartment building. There are there are cultures different than mine. There are people who look different than me. And so it was just a fascinating kind of introduction into, into how story in film is just really a reflection of life. Yeah. Do you remember what grabbed you about that film? It, it really was the love story. Cause I mean, obviously, um, they based that movie script on, on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. So, yeah. and I had never, you know, obviously at that young age, I never read that yet, but the love story itself captured me set against the battle between the sharks and the jets for territory, superiority, you know, control, power. But 
what really hit me was the love story between Tony and Maria. Yeah, great yeah. story, yeah. And I, I know Steven Spielberg is currently in the mix to remake that. Um, I, I love Spielberg, but uh, probably I won't see it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I treasure the original. I think it actually came out in the year I was born, 1962, if I'm not mistaken. I wow. might be. So any, any fact checkers out there, I apologize. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it won an Academy Award for Best Picture. Yeah, some things are better just left alone. <laughs> but then I don't know, you know, because we have some great remakes. Um, and maybe the people of that generation said, no, 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 don't, don't make it again. But, you know, well, everything old is new again. So, uh, yeah. How about you? What, what in your memories of your story, do you remember some of the first films that you saw? Um, chronologically, I'm not, I don't know. I really don't know. I just remember watching a lot of television with my mom, especially. She watched a lot. She still does. And I remember the first, to me, there are some films that are actually directly speaking into my life that are just from the soul into the soul and they're incredible. They're parallel with my own life in many ways. Some others, however, are, I call them archetypal, like Lord of the Rings, you know, they speak to a certain archetype in me. And if I'm in the season where that archetype is being awoken or called upon, then if I watch this story again, it will speak to me. But otherwise, I wouldn't just keep rewatching it. But those films that are so close to me, I would keep rewatching. Rewatching, they're like just five. They're not that many. But before the archetypes, they were actually the earliest archetypes, rather. Uh, the call to heroism, maybe in the boy, were two figures that uh, kept popping up in my childhood. One is from a TV show called New World Zorro. And um, I've since researched it. I've Googled everything there is. And uh, I found out the name of the actor. He's a Canadian actor called Duncan Reger, German uh, surname. I'm not sure if I even s I'm saying it correctly. Uh, great Zorro. To me, his impersonation of Zorro was just incredible. Was, I couldn't explain to myself, but I wanted to be like that. He was beautiful. like. To say that a man is beautiful doesn't mean that he looked good, but he did. It, it comes from the inside. It's not just about uh, the way he moved, the way he spoke, the, the nobility. I, I, I guess with men, I um, associate the word beauty with nobility. Not so much features, but actually the way he behaved and the, the way he was was just incredible. And there's another parallel hero who, who is Bulgarian. You know, His name is Vasil Levski. And there are many films about him with some actors that are better than others. But... He was also that Zorro type of guy. And he went around the country organizing. He used to have a good life, quiet life, and a rich life. He was meant to become a priest, which at the time was just, um, if you're a priest, then you set up for life. Then you just get fatter and fatter and fatter. And you don't, um, you don't rock the boats and you have a lot of money. But, and he was a deacon in a monastery and he decided to leave it because he saw his people were groaning under slavery, which at the time was Ottoman Empire. Uh, and so, so he went about organizing underground committees and things, and he sacrificed his life. He was only 37 when he died, I think, 36. Um, but his face will also express that nobility and that beauty. And these two characters, every film, and especially that show New World Zorro, and every film that uh, documentary or uh, just a film where Lesky would be shown, I was drawn to these people. But it wasn't, wasn't long before I knew that I could never be like them. Like I had nothing. And then I, I left them behind. So wow. that's, yeah. Hmm. What drew you to those characters that you just described from, from those mediums? What, what do you feel drew you to them? Just pure childish or rather childlike desire. That's it. Okay. I couldn't have words for this at the time. Just a desire. Later I became these ashamed of my, it. These are my words that you wanted to be like them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Because the swashbuckling hero of Zorro, yeah. I mean, every kid, me included, pick up a stick when they're outside <laughs> and fight swords, you know? Yeah. And, um, 
you know, I heard you mention the Lord of the Rings. Um, absolutely one of my, my favorite treasured trilogies. And I actually just, uh, within the last month or so, um, dived into the Hobbit trilogy as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, I mean, if we talk about films dating back to our childhood compared to the technology available now and with CGI and everything that was able to create such masterpiece films such as Lord of the Rings or The Hobbits, it's just amazing how story has, has stayed the same but technology almost has had to catch up in order to give us the epicness of story. Because something very interesting is true about my story. If I love a film and it impacts me, I will go back to it again and again and again. I can watch it um, so many times. Behind me, I have a, a four square of several films in my DVD collection. One of them is called All That Jazz, which is based on the choreographer Bob Fosse's life, starred uh, Roy Scheider. And I remember when that came out, I was about 17, 18, and I literally went to the movie house like 15 times in a row to watch that film because the first time blew my hair back and my heart exploded. It was like, wow, this is an incredible film. And I kept going back to see different parts. I would cue in on different characters. I would see the film through different eyes each time. And so that, that's another part of film and story that's really important to me because I love collecting DVDs and I love watching films, but there are so many films I don't choose to watch, don't want to watch, don't feel compelled to watch. I really, I really dive into films that speak to my story, my heart, my spiritual and masculine journey. But man, I love going back and back and back and back and back again into films. Perfect example. Last night I watched uh, Francis Ford Coppola's re-imaging of The Godfather 3, which is now called The Godfather Coda, The Death of Michael Corleone. And we've talked about The Godfather films, and we'll probably talk about them today, I hope. Yeah, but, oh yeah. Yeah. but I always loved part three. A lot of people didn't for various reasons. One Me and too. two, are obviously the first and the, the sequel are massively epic, historically acclaimed films bookended together. Part three came out, I think, 16 years after part two was filmed. It was done for a lot of reasons uh, Coppola and Mario Puzo didn't want to do, but they did it. Um, but it has grown on me in time. And so I, I was curious when I saw it was, was being re-imaged and I watched it yesterday. And honestly, I didn't appreciate it as much as I did his original filming and, and restoration that he did originally for it. So um, it, it is interesting, like we talked about on, on the front end of this conversation, how sometimes redoing a film may not work in terms of uh, satisfaction to the viewer. Um, but film films like that, stories that are epic, sweeping in their nature, um, always been drawn to, can, can always find myself tumbling into them, identifying with different characters, um, runs the gamut. Um, love stories, romances, crime films, fantasy, um, adventure, action, uh, dramas. Uh, yeah, so that, that's been my passion over my story is 58 years going on right now is, is uh, I, I, I couldn't see myself living without two things, music and films. I could mm. not see myself living without them. <laughs> yeah, same here, same here. Well, here's an idea. Okay. How about we each take turns to talk about a film that we really like and just go as deep as we want. And then, obviously, if one of us has a question, then after that, there will be room for questions. But do you want to go and, and give us something? 
All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking over my shoulder at the four square behind me, and uh, one of them on the top row, uh, classic Al Pacino film, Serpico. Oh, yes. True story of Frank Serpico, New York City police detective, uh, became a policeman and uh, became a detective, uh, but set in the 70s in New York City when police corruption was absolutely rampant. Um, I remember finding that movie actually through the book first by Peter Moss. I, I was a young boy, teenage, young teen, young teen when I read the book. And I remember doing a, a book report on it and it really fascinated the, the teacher because it was like reading level that was outside of my reading skills at the time, the subject matter. Um, and so I did this book report and it really got a lot of attention from the teacher. And then I saw the film and absolutely, um, this was done right after The Godfather was filmed. So Pacino was hot in terms of popularity, stardom. Um, he literally encompassed the character itself, almost physically. If you go back in time and look at some of the pictures of, of Frank Serpico when he was an undercover detective, it's uncanny how he captured the look, the walk, uh, the mannerisms of Serpico, and just the story itself. Uh, you know, it's a gritty tale. I mean, because mm. he, he becomes a policeman full of idealism. He, you know, he wants to he wants to protect and serve and help people and, and be quote unquote a good police officer. But right away in the story, he's he he bumps into the truth that um, there is corruption within the ranks of the NYPD. And so it, it really is a morality play of the torture that the character goes through where he has to choose whether, am I gonna take money or not? Am I gonna become a corrupt police officer or not? And Serpico drew the line, he said, no, absolutely not, no. I'm not gonna take money, I'm not gonna be corrupt, but in the beginning, I'm not going to be a rat either. I'm not going to. I'm not going to turn in my fellow cops. But the story became dangerous. And what I found fascinating by the film, Sidney Lumet was the director. The cinematography, the music score, Pacino's acting especially brings that film to life so vividly. He he portrays the kind of naive, young, idealistic you know, dressed in blue police officer really well. But then once he turns into an undercover detective where he finds he can work alone, I, I really am fascinated to see how his character through Pacino's acting really struggles. I mean, literally struggles on the, on the screen with his dilemma in his heart because it becomes dangerous because now the cops know he's not going to take the money and it's dangerous for him not to take the money. And then the NAP commission, which was the, the anti-corruption commission in New York City investigating the police in the 70s, they get a hold of him and, and they want to turn him against the cops. And, and he's boxed in throughout the story and, and literally, I love watching this film because you, you see Pacino just portray a man at odds with himself and the world around him. And, and literally, the anger, the fear, the frustration, he, he keeps getting transferred to different departments and he's told, yeah, they're, they're clean as a hound's tooth. There's no corruption. And obviously, each next stop is worse than the last. And, <laughs> So he's just trapped and and ultimately he does he turns he turns into a, a hidden witness and um, eventually you know he's set up and he's actually shot in the face during a drug bust where his fellow officers are holding back because they're hoping he gets killed because he's that much of a danger to the corruption system at that time in the 70s. And it was 
it was pretty pervasive. It was rampant within the, the police department. And this was unheard of. It was unheard of of a police officer crossing that that wall of blue silence to to testify and to accuse his fellow officers of such things as corruption, which everybody knew was going on. But but Pacino's performance didn't get an Oscar for it, was nominated, but the, just to see the agony he goes through, um, the character itself, but that that film in, in that time period really awakened me to not only the skill of an actor, but the skill of a director, the, how, how a movie can be put together through not only the script and the director and the lead, the actors, main actors, the stars, but then the supporting characters also play a role, the cinematography, the locations, the music, everything. So that really awakened my, my heart and sense uh, to what a movie is in terms of, you know, a, a production, but when it's done well by, by very talented people as, as Sidney Lumet, the director, and, and Pacino is the star of that movie, I mean, just galvanized me towards movies in, in a way that hasn't shifted. It's actually gotten more and more better, but I just absolutely adore Pacino's performance in that movie. I love that guy. He's actually my favorite actor of all times. It's kind of hard to say that, but he is. I love him to bits. <laughs> um, wow. Was there anything that was going on in your life or at least mentally in some ideas by this time? Because this is a very specific film. It's not for everyone. And it's also um, very heavy leaning on issues like integrity and, and, and you know staying whole and being whole and yet which is hard because being whole and not betraying either, which is difficult. Was yeah. there anything, any dilemma that was going on in your life at that time? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, so I want to I want to cut back to the importance of story, where where I first discovered the movie through the book. So re reading story, obviously, you know, film actors read scripts. So there was something about reading the story first before seeing the movie um, started to, to, you use the word integrity, I believe, and, and that's a good word to use because at that time, I remember the awkwardness of the young teenage years, not fitting in with schoolmates, you know, troubles yes. at home. We talked about that in Roots and Story. So there was something in me that identified as the loner with Pacino and the character of Serpico in, in, spe in specifics, because Frank Serpico ended up being a loner. He was alone against the NYPD. And so something struck a chord in me, not only through Peter Moss's book, but Lamette's film and Pacino's characterization of Frank Serpico that says, hey, that's me. I, I feel alone at times in my story. I feel alone against my family. I feel alone sometimes within my, my small circle of friends. Um, so something struck a chord to use your, your phraseology in my story as a young boy, young teen, that, hey, okay, I'm alone against the world in, in mm -hmm. some form or fashion. And um, watch out, keep my head on a swivel because um, <laughs> um, that's, that's a, it could be a comfortable place to be and it could be really a hard place to be. Because again, I took that away from both the reading of the book and the watching of the movie was, this man suffered in anguish uh, in, in his loner, the lone wolf, the, the man against the world. But mm. something too, I, I was attracted to that understanding that, hey, there's a part of me right now that feels that way. And so this almost is like a heroic character. Yeah. I'm, I'm not necessarily, because 
I, I have very few regrets in my story, George, but one of them was that I never did become a New York City police man or detective that was somewhere in my story way, way back that I wanted to do. And I, I, I believe it was, was from that influence of, of the Serpico book and the Serpico films. It was also NYPD and my family history, but there's a regret there that I never pursued that as an actual career or an opportunity for a life career for myself. But uh, there was also something about both the book and the movie um, it said, integrity is going to be attacked yeah. in a man's life. It's not going to be safe. It's always going to be attacked somehow. And I, I didn't know that at that early time. I, I maybe got whispers of that. What I know now, I didn't know then. But it, it is true. Integrity is attacked. It is assaulted in the story. Yeah, from day one, when you look at most boys, they actually are very idealistic and they think I'm never going to be a rat. I'm going to stand up for what is good. Most of them anyway, unless you're really damaged from, from the beginning. But uh, a friend of mine, actually, <laughs> he was always very idealistic and he was the model boy. Like he really stood up for what he believed. He became a firefighter. He was this one. He was my best friend. And I just learned two weeks ago that he killed himself. Um, and he, he just got married three years ago. We went to this wedding and everything. Um, and he actually lived in many ways, lived the dream because he was heroic. He was all over the newspapers and everything, rescuing people from burning cars and things. Wow. He loved it. Uh, and people used to laugh at him. Only I understood him. Like from our immediate friends, they used to laugh at him because, uh, because of the hero he used to watch things like Rocky and things. And he never really abused things like alcohol and drugs, which I did when I was with him. He always trying to hold me back, but I was older and I was trying to corrupt him in many ways. And yet we thought, <laughs> We, we really connected. And he would always tell me that he loved me, which for this big, athletic, strong guy, um, looked like a Hollywood star um, to, or a bouncer. I remember he was only 19 when we used to go out with him. He looked like one of the bouncers. <laughs> um, and, and only two weeks ago, yeah, I mean, he shot himself through the heart with, with his service uh, pistol. Wow. That's, and he made a statement, I believe, because that's something. Uh, about the hearts and, and I believe he was sort of going down the path of depression and things but he wouldn't talk about it ever since he got married things but anyway I'm not gonna this is a different podcast but he used to watch films like uh, Rocky and uh, and my other friends would laugh at him and say oh yeah tell us about Spider-Man <laughs> like but going back to the you're saying integrity is attacked people like this who they've got open heart and the world assaults the heart if it can't darken it Hemingway said it was one of my favorite quote, it's a terrible quote, but he knew this by experience, Hemingway, and look at the way he ended up. Um, yes. He said, the, world's, the world breaks everyone. Uh, I'm going to botch this, but and um, <laughs> even the strong ones he breaks, and those that he cannot break, it kills. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's true. But then he continues saying, many are strong in the broken places, which is my hope for me and you and people that uh, I love and respect that we actually be strong in the broken places. Integrity, when you look at Frank Serpico, there was actually, um, what most people don't know about integrity, they think it's just about being a good man, right? It's actually about being whole. And that's incredibly profound. When you, I listened to Al Pacino talk, 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 talk about Serpico. And, uh, and I really put two and two together because it's like, wow, you know, when you know what you're looking for, you see it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he said, um, Al Pacino, he wanted to hang out with, obviously with him. And um, they sat on the beach next to Frank's, house or something they had a drink and then I, i'll turn to him and he said uh, frank why didn't you take the money right you just you could have given them away to charity you could have done a lot of good with this money just keep quiet take the money and do good with them and then he turned to our Pacino and said "Ow, oh, if i took the money who would i be when i listened to beethoven now isn't that amazing he knew that part of him will have to go underground yeah. And that's what most people don't know. They think that yeah. if I lie, it's not good to lie because I'm cheating people. It's, it does more bad to you than, than the person that you, you, you are being, you know, um, sinning against, so to speak. Right, right. And the theme of corruption too, in, in relation to a man's integrity, Serpico's integrity, um, 
the world, obviously, the world story is so full of corruption, teeming with corruption, various forms and fashions of corruption, some very small, minor, some would consider, you know, not really important up to the huge, you know, heart life changing corruptors that a man will encounter in his story throughout life. And so I think there's a part like you're, you're spot on with your observations, George, that there's something that shook me as, as a young kind of teen, still a boy, you know, just stepping into a threshold of, of the journey to becoming a man that was shaken by that portrayal, by the story to say, okay, well, you know, maybe life isn't going to come in on a silver platter for me or, or a rolling cart of goodness. There's always going to be something coming after my heart. And yeah, I mean, we, we dived into this in, in our first podcast about Roots and Story. Man, that, that, that came to be true in so many ways that life came to my heart and story to corrupt it. So it's another fascinating thing about movies for me, George, is that they really do speak ultimately about the larger story, the real one story that every movie is really retelling, whether it's a romance, action, adventure, fantasy, whatever, crime, drama, they're all telling that same story about the human heart and its condition in some form or fashion. And, you know, that's the power of film for me. I, I want to be, when I sit down with a movie, whether it's in a movie theater, which obviously now with COVID I'm not doing, uh, but I enjoy films wherever, in the movies, sitting on my couch, watching Netflix, on a computer screen, through a DVD, streaming, however, but I want to be impacted by a movie. I want something to shift in my heart and story, either for or against the larger story when I watch a movie. So if, that, if, that's, if that's why I go to movies, if that's why I love movies, then I think I've been doing it really well since I was a young boy. So... How about you, man? What, what's what's a movie that um, you absolutely kind of go back to, love watching, is is special to you? I, I know both of us have dozens upon dozens of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny with me in films because um, I remembered some films, but I couldn't remember um, the name of the actors or anything. So um, a few times I would remember. So recently, in the last few years, when I've been reclaiming my life, broken parts of me coming back, um, I started reclaiming film as well. And they're not all nice movies, and they're not all just, uh, you know, some of them are in the shadow, and that's good because shadow work is important. But we're mm -hmm. going to talk about the, the more fundamental ones now who have aspect of everything. Um, I remember as a, maybe my young teens, I guess, I always remember the film with Robert De Niro, and um, a young woman and a young man. And I remember the song. Now I must have watched this with my mom because my mom would, my dad would go to sleep and my mom would just doze off on the couch and just let the films roll, you know, and whatever television was on. Uh, and I'll be next to her just watching whatever came, came on, you know. <laughs> uh, and she always slept through it. And she just saw like who is in it or whatever. Uh, but I remember the song and the song was Besame Mucho. In Spanish, uh, I don't even know who sings the original, who created the original, but there was a famous version by Cesaria Evora, I think it's pronounced the name of the lady. So um, I remember the song, I remember Robert De Niro in it, I remember Young Man and a Woman, and I remember raining, hard rain. And, um, and that's all I remember really. So in the recent years, I, I Googled this when, okay. when things started coming back and it came out and it was great expectations. Okay. 1998, I think. Um, and this, I can, it, it's kind of hard to rate because I've got four or five of the same sort of plane, but this probably will be number one, okay. probably number one. And I'm still, I'm still yet to study it in its fullness. It just, <laughs> um, it's something to be said about being drawn by things, remembering things without actually consciously knowing, oh, he's the actor and he played him or her um, or not even knowing about Charles Dickens. I mean, I knew about Dickens, but I hadn't read the book. And it's not based on the book properly. It's loosely based on it. But 
is the story, and I want to go deep into this because that's sort of the, maybe the closest ones to my heart. Mm -hmm. And it starts with the boy. The boy is in these idyllic settings, much like me, because um, it's in poverty. Because when you look at my village in Bulgaria, I mean, it's nothing special. It's, it's never really been rich. At least those guys, um, he was somewhere in Florida where there used to be a fishing community and it, it has been rich at some point, but then it had gone. So it's poor and, you know, and small, but he was happy. Being a child in nature, of course you'll be happy. Yeah. And um, he was living with his sister and her boyfriend or husband, boyfriend, I think. And, uh, and he was drawing, which is what I did as a child. And I'm yet to reclaim this. In fact, this film, when I started really watching it a couple of years ago, um, I started drawing again because of this. I've not done enough of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really stirred me. So he was drawing in a very unusual way, black and white, and it's just a weird drawing, which is very much individual expression of the soul. And uh, then he came face to face with his convict, who was Robert De Niro. You know, if you know the story, uh, he helps the convict escape, and he's this hitman on the run. And um, but what happens then? He falls in love with this girl, and she grows up, and he basically he's got this talent. He wants to develop it, but you know, um, as a child, he don't even question it. No, he just draw, but then as he grows up, something happens to him. He's still drawing, but this girl, she's groomed to become a heartbreaker by her um, aunts, I think. I'm not even sure what relative she is. I don't pay attention to this at all. Uh, it's very, basically Miss Havisham from, from the book. So uh, this old lady who's been uh, jilted, she lives in this big, rich, but neglected place. It's incredible because the place reflects her soul. Uh, it's, it's rich with everything, but it's just been left and everything is just uh, being, and it's called Paradiso Perduto, which means the lost paradise or the destroyed paradise. It's incredible. All the imagery, it's just, it's a beautiful film. And um, so um, her, this old woman's house has been broken and now she wants to take revenge on men. And poor young boy, whose name is Finn, played by Ethan Hawke. Great job. He did a great, great job. So vulnerable. Great, great actor. Yeah. And um one day he discovers that Estella, which is the same as name as the book, she's gone. She was played by Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, she's gone. But she was gone right after she sort of seduced him. And that was actually, there was a little beauty in that scene when she goes into his little house and it reminded him very much of, of my upbringing. And what's heartbreaking is that he doesn't know that his longing does not depend or is not attached to the woman. She is, she is literally said, all right, they're just like a, a doorway through which we see a glimpse of something that we long to possess. This guy doesn't know that. Most guys don't know that. They fall in love, they call it. And it's just all about that one person. So obviously you give your heart to somebody, another person, they go away with your heart. That's a very risky thing to do. I don't care who you are. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. And uh, so she came and she didn't, she hadn't shown much interest in him prior to it. And yet suddenly she found herself in his, his very room and she saw the pictures and he's been drawing pictures of her as well and the song that they play in this moment when she gets close to him physically is sun shower by chris cornell and it goes something like uh when you're all in pain and you see the rain comes down which is like almost like the relief from the pain uh, which is interesting because the guy actually killed himself who wrote the song um and it says something like I, I don't really remember this, but one day, oh, you graces, one day we'll, we'll flower into the great sun shower, something like this. Um, basically, keep heart. It's all right. Mm -hmm. When you're all in pain and you see the rain comes down, it's all right. And maybe he was writing this about himself. I don't know. Um, and it's just haunting. It's haunting to watch. It's not about the, the, the seducing or anything. Uh, it's just haunting because I know what's happening. The longing of the young man just attached to this woman in the idyllic settings. Cause you know, I never had a sense of being poor. I mean, obviously we always had a lot to eat <laughs> uh, in the village from Bulgaria, you know, there's hardly any poor people, unless you, you just drink all day, you will have a lot to eat. And my dad and mom, they both work. So we had, we, we didn't have much money um, right. although in, in comparison to others we had, but we had plenty. So I never felt that I was poor in comparison with the rest of the world, but we were. So when you look at the village, you know, it's nothing special and yet, looking at it, looking at the mud and the, and the pig, you know, whatever. Um, I never felt this was sort of holding me back. I felt this is, it's wonderful because that's not all there is. You know, the longing says, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. You know, because that's, that's not all there is. That's where 
you're coming out of, but most of us don't come out of it. And most of us learn to hate this and, uh, and it defines them then. And then uh, it, you de de devolve into somebody who's not proud of your roots at all. So this young man, I don't think he, he was that conscious of poverty. I think he, his longing was just so beautiful. And then she went away. <laughs> mm -hmm. and he went looking for her next day and then the old woman said oh she's gone she's gone to Paris for two years and Vienna whatever she's, she's gone um, and then and this is the moment now now after the song sun shower when the longing was just raised and isn't that the, the message of the world the world will just feed you longing say yeah you could be anyone you want yeah find the love find, find the true one just to inflate you only then to just burst your bubble mm -hmm. and that's what happens the world breaks everyone and if you don't have God if you don't have any deeper hope, if you don't know yourself, uh, you're gone. And not just gone, it's dead, but spiritually gone. Because, right. you know, you're losing your heart. Then, like my friend, my friend had an open heart. He couldn't bear the pain and he killed himself. He shortcutted the process. Um, I'm still angry with him. <laughs> it's been two weeks. I went through the grief, but I'm angry because we could have right. talked. Anyway, um, so the, the man is, the young man is longing and then he's given the bad news. And then the very next song that comes on, it's a song that's written especially for the movie and it's haunting. Now it's, it's more haunting than the first one because it has, a, it has a very particular message. The first one is even more general. It's Siren by uh, Tori Amos. And it goes something like, um, I was never one for a prissy girl. girl. She's a coquette. She's uh, she's not holy. Rich high doesn't mean she's holy. It just means she's got a cell phone. You know, in other words, like, okay, well, the siren, the, the 72 with the siren call because the siren, they lure people. And, uh, right. and, and in this case, that woman was the siren. But then the message that doesn't mean she's holy, it's what happens to us when, it's basically like the sour grape story, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, this beautiful woman is too good to be true. Or, or this man who is a leader, now nah, he must be toxic. It's that thing that um, we don't want to hope in this because we've already been let down one. And so from now on, I'll hope less. We're shrinking our desire to the basic proportion to what, uh, to the size of the heart that the world has left us with. Yes. Because you have a big heart when you come into the world. And then this woman is like, wow. Now, and then suddenly the song comes on. And as the song comes on, the guy narrates. And he said, um, let me pull it up because... Um, I'm not very good. The quotes are all in my head, but it's good if I can actually see the actual words. Great expectation. Just bear with me. There was, um, yeah. So then it says, seven years passed. I stopped going to Paradiso Perduto. I stopped painting. Wow, that's mm -hmm. interesting. I put aside the fantasy and the wealthy and the heavenly girl who did not want me. None of it would happen to me again. I've seen through it. I elected to grow up. Wow. Just talking about this just sends chill down, down my spine. I elected to grow up. It's, wow. What does it mean growing up in the world's point of view? It means leaving part of you behind. It means being having amputated part of you and then you grow up. And you know how he grew up? And there's uh, the footage of, of him just fishing. Now he stopped painting. The only thing he could do is just fish. And, and he's just, just surviving. And as the song goes on, he walks... In this, in the local, I wouldn't even call it nightclub. That's why it's so close to me because, in that context, like a club or a pub, whatever you know, out and and, and he drinks his beer and he looks out into the sea, and, and in the imagery is to do with a siren in the sea, and it's something that you can't reach. A bit like Gatsby, the great Gatsby, the book. Um, the longing has been thwarted. Now the boy is gone, and the man who just survives is there, and just wow. this. Wow. So for me, this is massive. Yeah. And I got to confess, I, I, I know we talked about this film in Roots and Story, so I know it has an impact for you as a man in, in your story, in your, in your masculine journey within men's work. Uh, I find it fascinating what you just said, George, in, in telling and painting that picture, that there's also another truth in film and story, and that's where music comes in, too where the filmmakers use music, whether it's orchestral scores or, or produced songs that are sung in background around certain scenes that really does unlock story for a man watching a movie, 
subconsciously or consciously or both at the same time because even going back to West Side Story, it imprinted in me, music is vital to a movie. Mm -hmm. And then as we talked about in, in Roots and Story, music is vital to me. So one, once that marriage comes together in, in the production of a film with the music, um, something happens to the viewer, to you, to me as a man, that amplifies not only the story but the impact on the heart. I gotta confess, I never, I never saw that movie, so I'm, I'm really gonna, gonna check that out and search it out. And to be otherly honest, I never read the book, so it's, it's like that's a story, a great story in the pantheon of stories that I'm hearing an invitation based on the impact from you to say, hey, check it out because there's so much going on in that man's story with the beauty, with the other characters. And then the fascinating part is how deeply it has impacted you over time. Mm, thank you, yeah. And you know, that's why I would invite all of our viewers and listeners to, because I didn't know anything about this film. I just knew something from a particular film has stuck with me. So in the later years, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to investigate every bit of my life that there is because there is gold there. So it's worth following every trace. If something is stuck with you that you can't get rid of or you can't shake, you're thinking, what was it about that film? Go check it out. Look it up because you'll be surprised. That's how I found this gold, this treasure. I, I wept. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that. And you brought up a fascinating part. You were talking about you know, your mom and television. I, I just, you know, we're going to riff here, obviously, today. But I remember also as a young boy, uh, my parents were watching the film Bonnie and Clyde on television with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. And I wasn't allowed to watch it because I was a younger boy. And I remember sneaking out of bed crawling on the floor of the apartment down the hallway and peeking around while my parents were seated on the couch with their backs to me watching the film and I, I remember this sense of being like a little kid outlaw like I'm watching <laughs> something I shouldn't see and of course the content of the movie there was violence there was sexuality um so they, they were protecting me, but, you know, obviously don't, don't do that. Tell no. a kid, don't do that. Of course, you know, I'll speak for me. Tell me, don't do that. I'm going to try and find a way to do it just to see what they tell me I'm not supposed to be doing. But that also started something in me towards um, content of film. It's like over time, over my story, over history, you know, I, I've watched all sorts of content in film. And so, you know, there is impact, not only through the, the script and the acting, the, the music, the directing, the cinematography, but also the content of the story. Mm. And so this is a great topic that you've chosen to talk about today, film and story, because, you know, so much about story in movies impact me and like you, it travels with me in my, my spiritual and masculine journey. I know God speaks to me all the time through movies, ever since I was a young boy, no question. And, and life speaks to me through movies. It teaches me something about myself in the moment, but also over my shoulder in the past and looking forward into the future. About a man, like you said, in, in terms of that character, I elected to grow up. I mean, what a profound statement for a man to utter. Yeah. And a truth to, to be taken and moved into the reality. I'm not going to be the boy anymore. I'm going to elect to grow up into manhood. I mean, movies can move people to move. I'll speak for myself. They have moved me to so many things, both on the spectrum of goodness and a reflection like we talked about and, and you and I know from decades of men's work into the shadow as well. I mean, that's why I love the Lord of the Rings just on the basis not only 
take it out of the realm of the genre of fantasy film, but good versus evil, of course, but then there's this literal shadow mm. of Sauron, the, the power of shadow in story. And so, yeah, even just that memory you brought up when you, when you opened that tale about Great Expectations, about I remembered that young little boy crawling out mm. to see the forbidden fruit of what Bonnie and Clyde were doing. <laughs> amazing yeah, yeah. amazing and tie it into a recent film uh, if you've never seen it's on Netflix it's called The Highwaymen with Kevin Costner and Woody Harrelson they play two uh, hired hands te old Texas Rangers who were brought out of retirement to go after and capture and kill Bonnie and Clyde so absolutely a phenomenal new look at a very old story. Cause I mean, the, the cinema's version glorified Bonnie and Clyde. And obviously, you know, you had two beautiful, handsome, beautiful actors, actresses, you know, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway portraying that, you know, they were the Robin Hoods back then stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. But the flip side of, of, of the grizzled old lawmen in, uh, that were played by Costner and Harrelson, man. It's a phenomenal film. So if, if your viewers get a chance to check that out on Netflix or, or other mediums, do so. It's a really, really great film. And Kevin Costner is one of my favorite actors as well. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. It's incredible how, you know, as at the time you wouldn't know why you've been impacted, but it's definitely worth going back. I, I just couldn't stress this enough because of the gold. And because of this, I actually picked up um, drawing. Yes, I haven't done it in a while, but it's part of my to-do list. And I, have, I did do it for quite a bit, an hour at a time here and there. And it gave me such peace to just draw with pencil just because of that film a couple of years ago. So isn't that amazing? There's gold for us when we pick up the pieces. So um, do you want to go and come back with something when you, of, of your own? Uh... So, so what, what, so I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to start this way. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so, so maybe, so, so think about another film in, in your personal experiences and library of, of favorites um, and maybe speak to this question. What are you looking for? in the story of a movie that sometimes you're missing in your heart? And so think about that question. What, what do you go towards in story in a movie that sometimes you're missing in your heart, maybe from being a boy, maybe in the present as a man, maybe something that you long for and, and tie that into a movie that has spoken to that question and maybe given you an answer? Definitely number one thing. That's a great question, by the way. Is your yeah. turn with the questions. <laughs> um, definitely number one would be um, masculine fellowship. Because, you know, growing up and, okay, here's a film, Dead Poet Society with uh, Robin Williams. It's, I haven't seen it and he is, he, yeah, so I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. So, uh, It's a great film, again, about the, the, the heart and the loss of heart, very similar to the first one for a reason. And uh, you find that four or five films that I'll name, they're very, they have similar running themes, which is what I've discovered. I didn't arrange this. Now, for my application, that's the film where he's the teacher in the boys' school, correct? Yes, yeah. Okay. He's in, he teaches in poetry, but he's uh, <laughs> not your... Um, Typical teacher, to say the least. He's a revolutionary. He just teaches them that poetry is in everyone and everyone is special and they, ha they have a verse to contribute, so to speak. And, Carpe uh, diem, seize the day. Sorry? Carpe diem, seize the day. I think that was one of the- Yes, yeah, seize the day. Okay. Carpe diem, yeah. And um, Ethan Hawke again in it. But yeah. for some reason I gravitated towards those films, I think when I saw them on the screen, um, 
as a younger man, a boy actually. Um, and I think partly, yes, it's because of the hard story, which I wasn't aware of, but subconsciously was maybe, but partly is the masculine fellowship that they, those boys, those young men, they, they had something going on. They were, I mean, they had a, this fellowship, they are open with one another, they can challenge and confront and, and fight for one another and um, stand up for one another, love one another in a very masculine way, just like normal boys would do, whatever that is. Because, But I, I wasn't a normal boy. I was a kitchen window boy. <laughs> I didn't have, you know, uh, in some expressions later, I, I developed some of that, but I was already living under the cover of, of falsehood. But when I was more myself, younger, I didn't go near an, a, another boy in this open way. And, and the few friends I had, they were all like me. Uh, we saw the hiding together. So number one would be this. Then it would be the romantic relationship, but that came a distant second, I think, definitely. Well, yeah, okay. For, yeah that's, that's interesting that, again, the, that's why I asked the question because I, I really, it's, it's one of the things we talked about music extensively last time. And, and again, the films, two things I couldn't live without, music or movies. Um, for me, and you already mentioned it, it's the character of Rocky Balboa. Um, those pantheon of films literally are at a core in my story. Um, I remember when, when Rocky came out in 1976, one of my older brothers saw it and he came home and he said, man, you got to see this movie. And it, it was just something about, he was my hero brother in my family story. So, so to hear my brother Jeff who was my hero, say, you got to see this movie. Something, th there was a deeper invitation in masculinity to me. Now, the backstory of Rocky is fascinating. Sylvester Stallone was, was a, you know, a, a, not a famous actor, a, a very small character actor, but he literally sat down and pounded out the script of Rocky over just maybe a 24 to 36 hour period. Dude was broke, no money, early in his marriage, not going anywhere with his acting. But he had this story based on the, on the boxing match between Muhammad Ali and Chuck Wettner. And, and Chuck was the underdog. Yeah. Didn't win the fight, but but gained so much respect from Ali. But, but Stallone literally went to Hollywood. Now, when we say Hollywood, it's just like the big sign on the hill, Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. But Hollywood in reality is this absolute financial power juggernaut in our world that shapes culture and everything else behind it. Stallone walks into Hollywood and tells Hollywood, yeah, you can have this story, but only if I play Rocky Balboa and the rest is history. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable history for him. That was the doorway into the transformation of who we know Sylvester Stallone to be as this international movie star. Rocky, Rambo, The Expendables, everything else he's done, good or bad. But the story of Rocky for me, I didn't discover until I was in college. And, and it was, I, I kind of backtracked into Rocky, Rocky II, and then Rocky III came out while I, while I was in my early 20s. And no, that story of Balboa, the underdog, the fighter, the guy who at first doesn't become the champion but wins the heart and the love story the 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 mentoring of of the grizzled mickey gold mill is the box the ex boxing <laughs> him the broken brother in paulie you know but yeah, yeah. all of it and and the the adversaries he faced apollo creed not once but twice and clubber lang and ivan drago and on and on I mean, just the story of Rocky Balboa spoke to me, the broken parts of me as a young boy, as a young man, uh, the, the underdog, the, the, the man who always felt like he was fighting the world to get any sort of recognition or respect or place in the story of the world 
or even to capture the girl's heart. And Rocky, the story of Rocky, the films of Rocky, and critics have loved them, panned them, hated them, you know, they've come to love them, whatever. I, you know, I, I rarely ever read critiques or reviews of movies. I don't care. I don't care what somebody else felt about a movie in general. I'll go to a movie. If it moves me, it moves me. If it impacts me, it impacts me. But that story of Rocky spoke to me not only behind in the rear view of the young boy kind of feeling not powerful enough into the young man wanting to fight for something bigger in terms of dreams in my life. And also it's it's it spoke to the grace of losing things. Because, mm. you know, in, in some of the stories in, the, in that sequence, in that series, Rocky loses everything. Like in Rocky V, he literally loses everything because yeah. Paul mismanages the money and all sorts of things, all sorts of plots. And so, but, in, you know, the integrity, we talked about that very early, of that character, Rocky is always in the ring, whether it's for his own heart, the heart of Adrian, you know, to, to further what Mickey taught him about life, because really boxing is a metaphor for life anyway. Um, but that, that character, that story, the balls on Stallone to walk into Hollywood and say, yeah, you can have the script, you, you, you know, great, sign the check, but guess what? It's not gonna get made unless I play the role. <laughs> and that's just, you know, that, that real life story behind the movie story um, is just incredible. But yeah, that, that's a series of films that I, I treasure and, and go back to time and time and time again. I, I never get tired of watching them. And then the score of Bill Conte throughout yes. the, the, the films, just I, I, I still have mixed cassette tapes of all of the Rocky scores mixed together, mashed together. You know, I'll bring them out sometimes and just listen to those those songs again to inspire me if I'm down or if I'm feeling like, you know, the fight's over and the bell's going to ring. I'll listen to those scores. And, and yeah, that character of Rocky Balboa is a treasure, a treasure to me. And, and the story of, of my masculine journey, really. It, it's, it's a through thread for me in my journey as a man. Mm, I love Rocky. Uh, in fact, my favorite is the last Rocky, the Rock, Rock, Rocky Six, Rocky Balboa. For some reason, I, I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Because it's deep. Carrying the character on in Creed and Creed Two, and and that's I, I, if if I'm not mistaken, Creed Two brings the Rocky Balboa character to a close in in that movie, yeah. the spinoff of Apollo Creed's son and Creed Two. But Rocky Balboa, the, the film you just mentioned, was, was the pe really the, the penultimate after one, Rocky through Rocky V. When we see Rocky, Adrian's died. Yeah. You know, he's got the restaurant, so that's really now his glory. But the, the walls are covered with the pictures of his former fame. He, he's lost a huge part of his heart where Adrian has died, no longer inhabits. And, and he, he's reawakened to love, really, yeah. in the form of a character coming from the original Rocky movie, which was the young girl he walked home when she was hanging out on the corner. And in Rocky Balboa, she's now a grown woman who kind of reawakens Rocky's heart to, to love. And, you know, he's also reawakened to what really is his calling to fight, to, to be a boxer, to be a fighter. And, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's really, for me, it's a, it's a beautiful cut in the whole story. I, Creed and Creed II are great films, but for me, from Rocky to Rocky Balboa, um, that really is a journey of six films that tell a man's story, you know? Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say something about Rocky and I forgot, but 
Ah, uh, yeah, you know, my friend who, who, who died, his phone used to ring with a da -da -da. I mean, you're talking about 20, like early 20s. And that's why my other friends used to laugh at him because he's like so childlike, like, why would your phone ring like this? Well, he was very idealistic. But and again, uh, the power of film in culture, that theme song, pretty much if you hummed it to anybody <laughs> in the world, they would know it. And also the visual Iraqi running up the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum yeah. and jumping up and down. That's an iconic cultural touchstone. People do it all the time, still yeah. to this day. They'll run up those steps and do that because of the character Rocky Balboa. And yeah. they, they, they inhabit Rocky at that point. So that's the power again of film, of story, of the masculine journey. I, to me, there's a, there's a great spiritual through line through Rocky and the stories as well. But that, that's the power of story and film to invade and insinuate itself into culture across time. Yeah. And so again, I mean, that's, that's just a beautiful part for me to see how powerful story is, how powerful film is, and how it could shape generations of men who rediscover it maybe again, like you rediscovered some films, I'm sure, or yeah. see it for the first time, you know, young men or boys see it and say, oh, wow, this is a, it's a new story to them, but maybe to their fathers who originally saw it, it's, it's something they treasured, so. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, but to go back on your question, I don't think I'm finished with that. <laughs> uh, wow. Because you said, you know, in boyhood and adulthood, and I didn't cover adulthood. So in boyhood would be films like Dead Poet Society, where all the boys are together and, and sort of become a man together, and fit in physical sort of proximity. But it's funny, what I really loved for most of my life to watch, uh, which had very little to do with my life, really, but... Uh, for some reason, I craved it. I didn't know why. Uh, and it was the Mafia movies. And now I know why. It's not about the Mafia. It's despite the Mafia. But it's like those men. Uh, and it's kind of sad that <laughs> when you see that close fellowship of men, uh, very rarely do you see, because, yeah, you see the darkness, right? That's the shadow side of what a good masculine community should be. But you don't see the light. And that's why part of the reason why so many young men, and, and not young, are drawn to this without knowing why. Well, if you examine it, when you look at they have their community and they have their women and they have their, their men and, and they're somewhere on a meeting or like a wedding and then they look at one another and they go and they have, they're talking about this thing of ours, they call it. Obviously for them, it's a selfish gain and it's just money and respect, whatever. But isn't that a great idea? Isn't this why beyond the darkness, beyond the issues that we all might have, actually why we're drawn to this? Because if you redeem this, it's like, yeah, of course, men together, fighting for one another, dying for one another, physically, spiritually, whatever. Mm, but because we haven't got this anywhere above ground, it's, a, it's all underground, really. Um, for some reason, I was never drawn to the that much, to the military or films about the police force when men have this circle, because there are so few, I think. And I, for some reason, I didn't feel they were real. I just say, yeah, yeah, maybe he's a boy, yeah. So that, yes, maybe these people fought war, like Band of Brothers. But then uh, there are very few real band of brothers. Ladies. And when, when you look at the gangster films, they're all bunches of men together, you know, and uh, for a bigger cause. And it's like, huh. So that's what I was seeking to feel, the emptiness of uh, my lack of masculine fellowship. And not just masculine fellowship, because you can go to church, right? And they have men's group. But it's kind of not the same. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like those men, you, what you get is, you know, what you see is what you get. And... And I grew up with men like that, not so much gangsters, but men who had that material. And like my dad's parents, they were very rough uh, in many ways. But uh, with them, you knew. You knew who they are and you knew what you can get from them. And I'll never forget that my father had this friend. Is, uh, they used to call him the priest because he had a long beard. He had tattoos, the old tattoos. Like my, my dad has them, not proper tattoos, but just drawn with whatever they found yeah. somewhere. <laughs> and uh, and he loved cars and motorcycles and he was aggressive and he was crazy he drank a lot he drove always he drank and drove you know and one time i had to share we had to go to my dad's village and he comes from a smaller house and this guy drove the car and he drove really fast and he the only person he respected was my dad that's why i started to worship my dad because my dad 
just had to say no and he was so he's like a mad dog anyone else if this guy gets drunk nobody could, could control him um but my dad did and that's why i was wow that's sort of man you know and i remember i had to share a bed with this guy because he was um there was not enough room for us all to sleep in so i slept next to him and oh i mean he was a haunted guy uh really must have been a tormented soul because all through the night he was gritting his teeth and i could hear this very very loud sound so that's sort of man <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of, he also died a few years ago. He, he drank himself to death in the village. But that's the sort of man that, that I can relate to. And so when you look at the mafia characters, the rougher mafia characters, which is more like them, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's the fellowship. Uh, so to, to finish that question, yeah. But also to finish up the story of dead, uh, dead poet society, it's funny because one of the guys, he wanted to become an actor. He wanted to express his heart. And there's a scene there between... Him, I don't na- know the name of the actor, and the, the other guy who was kind of shy and who was very much like I would have been in that bunch because they were all um, trying to express themselves or find expression. Uh, and this guy played by Ethan Hawke again, even younger here. And he wasn't like that. He wasn't contributing to the group. He, wasn't, he didn't want to. And so when, when this other guy challenged him, and uh, he said, listen, I'm not like you, Ethan Hawke said. I'm not, um, you say something and people, listen, I'm just not like that. And that's me. That's my story. But then the other guy turns around and he says, don't you think you could be? With a lot of passion. And of course, if you'd asked me if, even 10 years ago, I would have said, no, I wish I could. But that's people are what they are. People don't change. Now I know that's a lie. But that scene was like, wow, don't you think you could be? If you're drawn to this, then, then you could be. You could hatch. You could, you could come out of this whatever um, life has put you in. And, uh, but the tragedy of the open heart, who didn't know the source maybe of, of life fully and love, it's like this guy who wanted to become an actor and who woke everyone up, his father wouldn't let him. His father wanted, he, he had an idea for him. His father was a very rigid guy, come from poverty, and made it in business and said, right, my son is becoming a, I think he's a lawyer or something like this. And his father wouldn't let him act and he was very harsh with him and he killed himself, just like my friend, because my friend went and, um, and he shot himself in his parents' apartment, which is very interesting because he was married. Uh, and this young guy, he used his father's pistol the guy in the film to kill himself and when they find out about the death Ethan Hawke was most impacted he was sort of the shyest one and she he was just he was crying and and he kept saying he, no he didn't do it his father did it his father did wow. it his father did it which is when I watched it I wept because yes of course his father did it he yes. amputated his soul the rest was yeah. just so um, just to round up about this story man so much in it so much yeah yeah, and that's a beautiful story, George, because, I mean, a- again, the, the, the power of the story to connect the dots in a man's own masculine journey sometimes, that's one of the gifts I think film brings to anyone who, who's willing to be honest and look in the mirror. If I'm honest enough to look in the mirror at my own story, and then have the courage to go into films looking for those missing pieces. That's why I asked the story, the things that my heart longed for. Um, again, it's a spiritual to masculine journey combined, sometimes separate, sometimes combined, but there, there's a gift there. There's a healing there. There's an opportunity to grieve some wounds there. There's an opportunity to look at shadow there's an opportunity to to claim some of the gold of the masculine journey you know you know you and i have have been impacted by john eldridge and his stories and the wild at heart ministry at at different levels and that's one of the things i love about his men's boot camp is he uses film clips right from the get-go to wake men up that hey this isn't church guys this we're, we're we're in the story now and so he'll use film clips and, and the team will use film clips to, to accentuate not only what they're teaching on or, or, or talking about, but just to remind a man, hey, there's always story going on inside of me, inside of you, in the world around us, in, in God's story, in the masculine journey story. It's all story. And so the story is so important. And um, I find it interesting you, you bring up mafia movies. Have you ever met a movie star? Um, 
No. So, segue, boom. All right, we both love The Godfather. So to all the viewers out there, we're unabashed favorite <laughs> fans of The Godfather trilogy by Francis Ford Coppola. So it's the late 90s, okay? I literally maybe am a year or so into my new name, which is Johnny Fontaine. We'll mm. talk other times about my epic story about my name. Okay, so as you know, or maybe some of your viewers don't know, one of the main characters in The Godfather is the singer Johnny Fontaine, which is based on Frank Sinatra in real life. Okay, so it's the late 90s here in Louisville. I'm working for an organization called the Broadway Series, and I'm in downtown Louisville. And I'm on this, this main street in downtown called 4th Street, and I'm coming out of a shop, and, and I see them, they're, they're past me. I see it's, it's what I make up to be a, 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 a mature man, a, an older man, walking arm in arm with this tall, leggy, black-haired woman. And so I worked with this woman at the Broadway series called Jenny. And from the, from, they had already passed me maybe 20 feet or more. And from behind, I thought it was Jenny. So I'm walking up behind the couple. I'm thinking, okay, I'll surprise her. She doesn't know I'm here. I'll just surprise her. So the man was on the left, the woman was on the right. I come around the side of the man. I look over and I do the double take. And lo and behold, it's Robert Duvall who played the consigliere Tommy Hagen in The Godfather and Godfather 2. Wow. So I look over and I realize the woman is not Jenny. It's not my coworker. Beautiful, uh, what I'm making up a Brazilian woman, just stunningly gorgeous. But I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm walking in step, you know, as people pass each other as they're walking. I'm, I'm sitting there, standing there thinking, I'm walking right next to Robert Duvall. So the woman sees me looking at her. I'm just grinning ear to ear. Robert Duvall looks at me, our eyes lock. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use the, the expletive I use. I'm going to use a variation of it. I go, Tommy, Tommy fucking Hagen, Tommy. <laughs> and they stop, literally dead stop. He's looking at me like, okay, who's this bozo? What the hell is going on here? I said, Tommy, you don't recognize me. It's me, Johnny Fontaine. And he's just kind of half smiling at this point, maybe thinking I'm not totally nuts so sane, you know, gonna gonna grab his wallet or something. But they we all have stopped at this point. And he goes, uh, okay. And I go, no, really, Tommy, it's me. I pull out my wallet and I pull out my driver's license, which has my name, Johnny Fontaine on it. I hand it to Robert Duvall and he just explodes in laughter. <laughs> Hugs me. Goes, Johnny, Johnny. He grabs my face. He kisses my cheek. Um, he goes, so good to see you. And uh, He went so into we, character right away. Yeah, we, we get into it and he's just like, that's your real name. I go, yeah, I, 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 I'm Johnny Fontaine. And so we, we had a little pleasant five minute conversation. He was actually in town with the woman. He's a, he's a pretty world famous uh, ballroom uh, dancer guy. He has some mad dancing skills. He does like oh. salsa dancing and, and all this sorts. So he's like really, really gifted as a dancer. So he was in town actually for a competition with this woman where they were dancing together. And so that that's my, uh, that's, that's just, uh, that's one of my uh, movie star stories, but that segues into our love of the Godfather. So I, I think it's time we talk Godfather. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've got a, I've got a few others, but I'm going to give you the Mm, yeah, if you want to. Okay, so yeah. where, where did you, because again, I, I echo your thought. There's there's something about the, the, the masculine fellowship, fathering, sonship, camaraderie, 
you know, a, a band of brothers mentality that's, that's an under and over in the story of the Godfather that has spoken to men more subconsciously than consciously throughout, throughout cinema's history. I think that's why men are really drawn to the Godfather story. I, I echo, like you said, I don't think it's a, a love or an adoration of, of mafia or, or crime in and of itself. I think what the story does, what Mario Puzo has done and Coppola did with, with the cinema versions is display the complexity and the deep need for a masculine fellowship. Uh, and also the connection of father to son, which is also can open up a whole different discussion about spiritual father sonship. So, I, so I'm curious to see how, where you dis, when you discovered those films, and and maybe what some of their impact was on, on your journey and your story. Oh, huge! Yeah, um, Godfather One, I think one was uh, on television at some point in my maybe early teens or something along that uh, period. And I just remember, you know, just like that other film, I just remember Marlon Brando. I remember the father thing. I, I remember Michael by Al Pacino is my favorite actor. Uh, and I remember Sicily. So was it Godfather 1 or, or Godfather 2 that had uh, a lot of, no, I think Godfather One definitely. Sicily about the mom being killed. Right. So in Godfather One, there's the, the part where Michael has killed Salazzo and the police captain, and they the, the family and Sonny send him to Sicily to hide out, and that's where he meets Apollonia and gets married. So that that's where, in the in the trilogy, that's where we kind of first are introduced to Sicily as a character, because C- Corleone, the town, is a real yeah. town. And Sicily itself is a character, not only in the book by Mario Puzo, but starting in the Godfather film proper. So that's where Sicily's first really introduced on, on the film in the Godfather. Yeah, I just remember, because I know my, my dad, he comes from a very poor village in the north of Bulgaria, which is totally different from where I come from. And, um, and because he is that strong figure, he was that strong figure in my life that I knew that I couldn't be like, and yet, um, for some reason, I was really drawn. And I, every time when the when Sicily was was shown and the music, oh my goodness, it uh, brought something. It I couldn't tell you what it was. And and in fact, last summer I was uh, again led to rewatch them, and this time I shed a lot of tears because I was reconnecting to some of my heritage. But uh, it's not that I'm Italian or anything like this. But right. for some reason, there was an archetype at work there with the father, with Michael, because you see, Michael was very different than, than Sonny. And Michael actually didn't like his father much. He loved his father, but didn't like him. And I had to come to a place with my own father to deal with the father wound, to really dislike him and his persona and his image, that strong figure. I had to, dis- I had to kill that in my own life. I had to get rid of him. It took me years. Um, but then in the last couple of years, I started moving towards that, towards actually behind the persona is the real person and my real father. And that's why I had to rewatch these films. It's funny because at my spiritual awakening, which uh, began, sort of began in, in Zambia, in Africa, after that, for about a year, I did not watch any film. I couldn't, I was, I was like a boy inside. I couldn't see any sex scene or any gunshots, any violence. I could just fall apart. I mean, I was going through this thing. I couldn't drink any alcohol. Uh, the only thing I had was maybe one beer with, with food every on Friday afternoon. Uh, but I was just, of course, I, it's almost like a baby. I started all over again. I didn't know right. who I was. Uh, and everything affected me so much. I was even some music, dynamic music, I wouldn't listen. Um, and only in the last two years, some of those films, because they're, they're films for adults. They're not for everyone. And depends what right. you're going through. They can hurt the inner child as much as you enrich him, depending yeah. on which stage you are. So that's like, I don't even need to say that, because if you're into inner work, you should know that. But if you don't know right. that... My parents didn't want me to see Bonnie and Clyde that night because they knew that that film's content would have an impact on me as a small boy. So, mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so Michael had to, uh, in his psyche, 
destroy his father or never even embrace him because he didn't agree with what his father did. Uh, but then when he came to blood, when he came to who he was as a son, he stepped up and he embraced his father as, as a dad, not as this gangster who, whose lifestyle he doesn't like, but actually right. as a dad. And, and that's what made him powerful because he'd actually, um, you say Shakespearean, I think, I don't think it's, it's, it's far more Shakespeare than mafia here. <laughs> even, even <laughs> like the... That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful look at it. It really is more Shakespearean than mafia. Archetypes and the sacrifice and the son and the old king. And um, so that definitely really played a role but in, in both Don Corleone and Michael Corleone. So to me, it's just, um, I still haven't really unpacked a lot of it, but every time when Sicily will be shown and Michael coming back to Sicily to see where his father comes from, I just felt this deep connection that, yes, yeah, I need to find even more about my father in me, not so much outside, but there is more, there's more to be reclaimed. And that speaks to that, that film. Yeah. And then Godfather 3 as well. Two, it's okay, but to me, there's a lot more mafia in two, which is okay. You know, it's a great film, but to me, one and three are just the best. Three may be even better uh, in, in a different way. That's interesting. So let me hear, let me track if I heard, just heard you correctly. So, so you see one and three and you, you, you kind of see two somewhat lesser than where where just for yeah. me in my understanding of movie criticism and movie critics they 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 book in one and two together as, as this as this epic you can't have one without the other and and so that that's but that's the beauty of films yeah yeah. And I think that's really where it draws a man, it draws you into an interpretative mode to say uh, how it speaks to my story. I, I have more value with one and three as opposed to some people couldn't have one without two or two without one, so to speak. But that, that's, yeah. So, but again, that's the power of the film, George, to awaken in you the understanding of your relationship with your father, of your relationship with your heritage, where you grew up, um, even though it's different culturally, geographically, you know, what the power of the filmmaker and Francis Ford Coppola did was he speaks to your story, even though on paper, it's nowhere near each other, mm. but yet the power of the story itself yeah. um, transcend that. And, and dive right deep into your heart to have an impact and, and move you, like you said, to tears, to understanding, to healing, to transformation. Uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think too, it's a lot more, you know, when you grow up and you, you still, your heart is soft, but then it hardens. And then you have to become somebody you're not. And then you spend years, most people spend most of their lives pretending to be somebody. And that's true for me. Michael is way too lost into the dark side and he's just being a gangster uh, and he's trying to be a gangster, you know? And, and yeah, that's a wonderful mafia film, but there's a lot more mafia, uh, which is all right. It's, it's, it's one of the trilogy, but one and three are like, wow, that's where he's most awake. And three is where he, you can see the repentance and you can see how how destroyed he is by a lot of what he's done and a lot of what happened to him. Right, and and rewatching the image, the reimaging <clears throat> last night of of the Godfather Coda, the death of Michael Corleone. Three really is the end story for Michael because all all of the story that that transpired in in the Godfather and the Godfather Part Two. Now you literally see it on the physical character of Michael Corleone, but also it's coming out from the inside in his soul, his soul's broken. Um, that scene at the end, uh, at the opera house on the stairs in, in what I'll now respectfully, in, in respect to the director, who's the creator, calling it Coda, the death of Michael Corleone, that scene where Mary dies, as, as an innocent bystander of the story's violence, mm. Michael takes her in his arms and that silent agony that comes out of his face and his body and his soul into this 
primal scream of destruction and just desolation and and loss and death it's it's one of the most powerful i mean i i i personally agree with you pacino's at, at the pantheon of of actors for me but that particular scene haunts me yeah. and i weep every time i mean i the tears came i, I want to say automatically but they weren't they, they were an honoring of of the story, the storyteller, the actors. And that's so profound to be able to, I don't know how many times I've seen the Godfather trilogy. I couldn't tell you. It, 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 it's dozens upon dozens in my history. That scene in, in Coda, the death of Michael Corleone, where Mary has, has been killed, his daughter is gone because of who he is and who he became, his father's son. And she she paid the price, and he's still alive. Um, it's a fascinating movie, and, and I'm not going to get into it for the viewers, uh, your viewers who haven't seen Coda yet. So so give it a look and see how Coppola has kind of reshaped the beginning and the ending. But the the ending the ending is different than what originally came out in the theaters only because that final scene in Kodo where Michael's a very, very old man in, in yeah. Sicily, the gray hair, the hat, he puts on the glasses and that's the last image we see of him. But between that scene on the steps of the opera house and that very final scene where he's sitting in the chair, an old man just moments away from his own death, Man, there's a whole lot of story in there that I would have loved to see on film. But that's the beauty. Coppola didn't, I'm going to use the word, prostitute himself mm -hmm. or the memory of Mario Puzo to come out with a Godfather 4, which I think Andy Garcia could have carried yeah. as an actor himself in the role with Pacino. Yeah. But there, there's so much in between that scene where Michael screams in agony of the story of his life as, as a Corleone, as the Don now, and his ending, his final breaths as a man on this earth. That, that, those movies came to me again when I was growing up. I didn't see them in the theaters. I mean, it, it, Godfather came out in 1972. Godfather 2 came out in 1974. So I was 10 and 12 respectively then. But they came out soon after on television, and it was a huge deal for The Godfather to be on TV because it was not only a huge piece of, of cinema going for moviegoers to see, but now like so many more people were, were introduced to the story of The Godfather. So that's where I first experienced it was on television, and it was just a fascinating fascinating just look into I, i've always we talked about this in the first uh, podcast roots and story fascinated with crime stories and and gangsters good and evil cops and robbers so i was in i was all in i mean this this movie just drew me in and what i like about two and 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 for me two is two is a two is a hard movie to watch because you get to go back in, in Vito's story. And, and Vito was a sickly child. I mean, his dad was killed in a mafia vendetta. His mom tried to protect him and she was killed. Um, so literally, he was a sickly child who lost both his parents through the mafia violence and then was sent to the US for his own protection, for his own well being, in order to survive. And he grew up a sickly child and literally given a new name. He was Vito Andolini from yeah. Corleone. And at Ellis Island, one of the security guards misread his name tag mm. and said Vito Corleone. So they named him after the town he came from. But he was a sickly child. And so he grew up devastated by the loss of his parents. And in a foreign country, he knew nothing about a sickly child. And then 
introduced into what would become a story of power, wealth, danger, violence, um, massive amounts of money and influence. And so he literally became the Don through the wreckage of, of a story that most men probably wouldn't survive <laughs> physiologically, psychologically, um, but he did. And, and yeah, the Godfather movie, I mean, I mean, Brando. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've spent many times thinking what other actor on the planet could have ever inhabited that role other than, and there were a lot of people that they wanted to play Al Pacino's role. They wanted Ryan O'Neill. They wanted Robert Redford. That's they right, wanted yeah. Reynolds. They wanted all these people. And Pacino was an un, really unknown, relatively unknown actor. And the fascinating part of the Godfather movie was Paramount Pictures was really not impressed with either Francis Ford Coppola's director or Al Pacino as, as the lead. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they were hot for Brando, sure, but literally they had a shadow director shadowing Coppola. They were gonna fire him and they were gonna fire Pacino until they had the dailies of the scene where he killed uh, Salazzo and the captain in the restaurant. And Coppola and did that, didn't he? Saw Al Pacino become Michael Corleone in that scene. You know, the, the standout scene from Godfather for me is literally when he, when Michael comes to the hospital and the father's been assassinated, the assassination attempt on Vito, he's recovering in the hospital, the guards are gone, the police guards are gone, Don Vito's all alone because some of, some of his enemies are coming there to the hospital to finish him off. Michael gets there and he goes into action. He moves his father to another room. Enzo the baker shows up yeah. with the boat of flowers. He tells Enzo, go wait outside. Michael comes out, takes the bouquet from Enzo, just pitches it, pulls his collar up, tells him to stick his hand in his jacket like he's got a gun. And then a car slowly in the shot from Coppola pulls up and, and you see guys, shadowy figures out there, but they speed off because they see Michael and Enzo there like guardians with their hands in their jacket as to reach for guns. So the car speeds off and Enzo shaking like a leaf. I mean, he's just shit terrified what mm -hmm. just happened. That's not his realm. That's not his story. He's a He's a freaking baker, man. He makes, <laughs> pot, makes cakes, cookies. He's, he's not a gangster. Michael, on the other hand, Enzo's trying to light a cigarette and his freaking hands are shaking. Michael takes his lighter because Enzo is so traumatized. He can't even flick the lighter. Michael takes the lighter and calmly lights the flame and lights Enzo's cigarette. And, and Coppola is beautiful as a director. He just focuses on Michael's hands and face. Yeah. And they're just calm. Like, this was the story he was born into. Yeah. And, and previously, he tells his father before he comes outside, he says, I'm with you now, Papa. I'm with you. Yeah. And, and so he, he, has, he, has, he has leapt over his distaste for his father's business and he has become his father's son and he will do anything, anything to protect his father and the family now, including giving up his own trajectory in life as the war hero, you know, to marry Kay, to become a husband and a father, all of that. In that moment, he literally, you know, found out what his calling was and yet yeah. it was, wasn't until he literally killed Salazzo and McCloskey in retaliation for the hit on Don Vito. That's that's the that's that's the point of no return for him, literally and figuratively in the story. But yeah, discovering those movies and then and then you know, as a young man, young adult, 
getting, you know, the, the original VHS copies and just mm -hmm. watching them, watching them. Watch. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a class in filmmaking and storytelling and acting. And yeah, I mean, those stories, the, the characters, Sonny and, and just the, the diversity between him and Michael, yet there's Fredo, the weak brother. Yeah. There's Tom Hagen, the adopted brother. There's powerful women, the matriarchs. I mean, you know, Kay's powerful in her own way. Connie and Mama Corleone are powerful in their own ways. Um, but that story across time literally speaks, I, I really believe, I, I think men are most often subconsciously drawn, like you talked about, to the fellowship, to the masculine fellowship, and the deeper story of father and son. And the and, warrior spirit as well, because there's a battle to fight. Yeah, I, I, I mean, so yeah, the, the, the context, I mean, and, and if any of your, your viewers have never taken a chance to read Mario Puzo's Godfather, read it. I, 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 I did myself the pleasure of rereading it this, this year in 2020, you know, uh, with the pandemic shutting a lot of things down, yeah. I had some time at home. And uh, it was a joy to go through that, that story written again and uh, to read that. But those, those films, uh, again, now I, I couldn't imagine any other actor but Al Pacino playing the role of Michael Corleone. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, uh, yeah, John, John Cazale as Fredo, Robert Duvall as Tom Hagen. Yeah. I mean, the cast of characters and then De Niro coming in too. Yeah. What, a, what a brilliant story, you know, how they intercut the past, Vito's past with Michael's present and kept flip-flopping. And there have been a couple of done versions. They did one for television. I remember this where they told it chronologically. They did a TV special kind of three or four nights. Where they I watched did. that in Bulgaria when I was a teenager. Yeah, I mean, that was, all, you know, again, television, the medium used The Godfather and, and Paramount and Coppola did it brilliantly where they introduced that story to so many millions more who maybe never saw it in, in the theaters proper. Yeah, but that's right. They, they kind of retooled it where they told it chronologically over four nights, taking one and two film apart and putting it in chronological order. And, you know, so that, that's, that's part of the powerful nature of those films. So, again, um, yeah, the, the, the myth of, of the mafia um, at its core if, if I take the corruptive nature of crime out of that story, it's just about fellowship. It's about family. It's about honor. It's about betrayal. It's about trust. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about power used for the goodness of, of helping a family and how the power of the dark, the shadow can corrupt everyone and everything and leave in its wake victims like in, in Coda Mary. She didn't deserve that ending. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mary Corleone didn't deserve to be, you know, gunned down by an assassin's bullet. Yeah. And Michael would have moved, he said, he said somewhere in that film, I would burn in hell to, to keep you safe, you know, and with all his power, with all his privilege, with all his wealth, with all his ferocity, with all his violence, with all of what was good in him, he still could not protect her. And in the end, she was a victim of yeah. his story. Of his story. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about the Godfather alone for, <laughs> for the whole podcast. Yeah, we, we, could, we could do an eight-part series, two yeah. hours hour video podcast of just the godfather yeah. but i have got a few because i haven't got that many i haven't got that many there are a handful of films that have influenced me deeply godfather is one of them um the other one is again i watched with my mom she told me what the title was it's called cinema paradiso 
I don't know if you've seen that. In Bogate, have, you have? I have not. I, I know of the film, so it's familiar to me, but I have not seen it. In Bulgaria, so it came out as um, some films to kind of go check out. <laughs> came out as new cinema paradiso, and again, and I see now why I was drawn to this film, because it's very much like me, small community, uh, small Italian Sicilian actually village. Uh, I forget the name of the village. This boy, he's drawn by the world of film and cinema, like we are, and uh, he's little. He helps this this old film guy who who, who works there in the movie theater. Um, and he becomes like a father to him because the boy's father is killed in the war. And as he becomes like a father, he starts mentoring him through many things, including, including love. Um, but he, he tells him some things which they were haunting and it really haunted me. And I've got the quote somewhere. I always have this quote close. Let me read it to you now. The boy is, comes... Just to hit your pause for a second, George. Is, is that the film with uh, Roberto Benigni? Is that the actor who plays in that film? I don't think so, no. The, okay, okay, you know. The main guy is a French guy. I don't know his name. He speaks Italian very well, but in, in fact, he's French. The main adult guy who plays the mentor, um, Alfredo. Juan Pepido? No, so many <laughs> French. <laughs> there was right. another French guy. So <laughs> my ass is a film buff here. <laughs> so, you know the way I felt about my village growing up? I felt there was beauty, there was, um, life was calling to me. Life was meant to be good, right? Life was meant to offer something. And yet when I started losing that hope, um, so the mentor of the boy advises him actually to leave and just go away, which is incredible because that's what I did. And um, he says this, and uh, towards the end of the film, he's blind. He was blinded by a fire from which the boy actually rescued him. And he says, um, living here day by day, you think is the center of the world, which is what I thought. I thought, well, this is, this is where I am. And there's so many wonderful places, but that doesn't make this place smaller or bigger. It's just, this is me, this is part of me. And he said, you believe nothing will ever, ever change, which is what I believe. You know, mom and dad are always here. My friends are always here. Good and bad is good and bad. And then he goes on to say, then you leave a year, two years. When you come back, everything's changed. The thread is broken. What you came to find isn't there. What was yours is gone. You have to go away for a long time, many years before you can come back and find your people, the land where you were born. But no, now, no, it's not possible. Right now, you're blinder than I am. Wow. And then he tells him, get out of here. Go back to Rome. You're young and the world is yours. I'm old. I don't want to hear you talk anymore. I want to hear others talking about you. Don't come back. Don't think about us. Don't look back. Don't write. Don't give in to nostalgia. So he wants to propel him out of this village. Very, very much like I felt a longing for the village, even when I was in the village. The nature right. spoke to me, but nature was, the world is fallen. It's like a doorway through eternity that's in our hearts. And if we know that, that's a good thing. Um, but he says, you need to leave in order to come back. And this is what we're talking about, reclamation. You need to destroy your idea of life, to allow it to, to die to yourself uh, in order to find it. You need to kill your parents in order to have your parents, to find them. It, he literally says, before you can come back and find your people. Now, it doesn't mean that your people physically will be alive, but they are. They are inside of us. You know, human soul is immortal, eternal. So for me, that's a massive picture of there's so much to this, this film and i'm not going to go into it there's so much that really relates to me but especially this about the beauty of the homeland of the home the home and then having to leave the home in order to find a real home so um cinema party so that's definitely one and i just kind of looked it up and and the cast is all foreign actors i'm assuming it's a foreign language film with subtitles and italian yeah yeah so uh Hey, I, I got a I got a little thing here we can do maybe as we make the turn towards home here. Um, um, I, I, I'd like each of us to pick three movies to recommend to your viewers and uh, people who will check this out on, on my platform and your platform. Uh, I can pick any three movies I want to recommend. We're not going to get into each movie in long discussions, maybe, but just three three movies that that are part of our 
hearts and stories and uh, to recommend to your viewers and my viewers and your listeners and my listeners. What, what, what cued me to that was, you know, thinking about Cinema Paradiso um, being a foreign language film with subtitles. One of my first movies uh, to recommend if, if anyone has never seen it is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon uh, by Ang Lee, the director. I know the film, I've never seen it. Uh, check it out. The wonderful thing is watch it with the Mandarin language being spoken and the English subtitles. That's what I've so, always done. No, you know, I don't, I, I'm rarely watching foreign language films with subtitles, but this is one that really has impacted my story and my heart. It's on the it's on the Foursquare right here. Uh, Chow Yun Fat and Michelle Yao and Zhang Zi Yi and uh, Ang Lee is the director. Fascinating film, just an absolutely beautiful story about a warrior. There's a love story. There's mentoring in there. Uh, there's battle, adventure, beauty. So that that's one of, of my uh, recommended films. Uh, I'm going to throw an Andy Garcia movie in there as number two. It's called Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. <laughs> this is a crime movie. It stars Andy Garcia, Christopher Walken's in it, Christopher Lloyd, uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, good actors, Treat Williams. It, it, uh, Andy Garcia plays this, uh, let's just say he's a, he's, a, he's a man with a talent uh, for, for gathering criminals together and, and doing odd sorts of jobs. But it's, it's a powerful movie. There's also a love story embedded into it. You see where I'm going with mm -hmm. crime and love stories. And, uh, but things to do in Denver when you're dead, starring Andy Garcia. That's an absolute classic movie. Um, number three, the third movie I would um, choose to offer to uh, your viewers, your listeners, it's a, it's a film by the Cohen brothers called Miller's Crossing with Gabriel Byrne yeah. and Albert Finney, another crime drama with a love story embedded. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> uh, fascinating period movie. Uh, just a story of um, friendship, love, betrayal, humor, dark humor. Um, John Turturro's in it. There's a oh. wonderful. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a movie I keep going back to again and again and again for the story of of, of Tom, the, the main character played by Gabriel Byrne, and the the dilemma he gets into being loyal to the, the local crime boss in the story played by Albert Finney and, and trying to capture the beauty's heart. Uh, the woman played by, um, her name is mistakenly absent right now. Uh, Marcia Gay Harden is the nice. actress. Here. So it's a fascinating film. Those are three of 3000 movies I could probably recommend. Uh, but those are the three I'm going with. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon uh, with Chow Young Fat. Things to do in Denver when you're dead, starring Andy Garcia, Wild Ride, and Miller's Crossing, Coen Brothers film by uh, starring Gabriel Byrne. And if you want to do that up with another Coen Brothers film, always a good choice is The Big Lebowski with Jeff Bridges. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's. Uh, hmm. How about you? Oh well, I I'm very torn because I want to recommend the ones that are the deepest to my heart, which uh, I think two of them I've just named, which is. Um, but I don't know because if we don't get into the other ones, I don't want to leave anything behind. As I said, I've got a handful of films that are really close to me. So um, one that I haven't mentioned, I haven't got into, and and I want into detail, but it's Scent of a Woman. Have you seen ah, it? Love it, love it, uh, love it. Cool. Love it. Long overdue Oscar for Pacino. They gave yes. him that Oscar probably to make up for like Serpico, Godfather, Dog Day Afternoon. The list goes on. But ah, good one. Amazing story. Amazing story. Father figure. Again, the boy, integrity. Should I rat on my friend? Should I be loyal? Um, and the I mean, just a speech at the end. <laughs> just just watch that. Yeah. <laughs> 
but also the way he brings life into the boy. And it's this guy who is who's a very controversial figure in many ways, and he's not been a good man in many ways. Uh, and he wants to he's, he wants to waste his life and just feel the best pleasure there is in life and then die because he doesn't see. And suddenly, when he found this young disciple, the best came out of him. Uh, yes. and, and it was beautiful. It's funny. And uh, for some reason, every time when I watch the tango scene, I just feel emotional because of the beauty, because of the way he handled um, the, yep. the beauty. Uh, it was just incredible. So Scent of a Woman, definitely. It's, it's one of my yep. core films that I always watch, always. Another one would be on the waterfront with Brando, 1954. Amazing right. story, amazing story. Uh, again, about integrity. Uh, there's, there's this priest that comes into the scene and uh, uh, there's a murder, murder going on. They, they saw the mafia, this gang controlling the, the Jersey shores. And Marlon Brando is very much a, a rocky figure. Yep. He's a prize fighter who sort of washed out. He never had a chance. Well, he did have a chance, but there's a story there that um, just a bit like Jake LaMotta taking yeah. dives for the, f just for money and then never realizing his potential. And he chose to, to, to stand on the good side. He chose to, to stop being silent. And I remember I watched this in a very important time in my life when I had to break with something from my Bulgarian roots, which wasn't good. We've always had some sort of oppression, not always foreign, but it's either in the forms of, um, local system or a mafia later in the 90s. So there's very much the awareness of the stronger person and that uh, crushes the spirit. So I had to break with some of that. I found that some of that in myself and, and, and I wept when I watched this, especially when he said towards the end, you know, because they called him a rat. And he said, from yeah. where you stand, maybe I'm a rat, but from where I stand, I've been ratting on myself all these years and I didn't even know it. Because he found his lost integrity in the face of the woman and in, in the face of the priest. Uh, he was uh, great, really. Yeah, so, um, Eva Marie Saint was classic in that movie. Yep. Mm, yes. Um, well, I don't know about another one. It's, I mean, there's, there's so many. I, I guess um, Bronxdale definitely is, again, one of my favorites. But, yeah. Absolutely. Give a shout out for our Bronxdale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there are... <laughs> There are definitely a couple other movies that I want just to, to mention in passing. Um, I love Shakespeare for some reason. Um, always have, for some reason. Never been deeply into it, but always have something, have had something. And there were, there were two films who were based on, um, one is based on Shakespeare and one is Shakespeare and is Hamlet played, uh, the main character is uh, Mel Gibson. So that's yes. 1996. Have you seen it? It's beautiful. Yes. Yep. The way he did Hamlet, I think, yeah, it's great, it's great. So um, that's definitely for those who like Shakespeare. There's another one who is based on Macbeth and it's with John Turturro in the main role. And it's also with, um, what's the name of the guy who plays in Everybody Loves Raymond, which is my favorite TV show, um, Peter Boyle. Oh, Peter Boyle, oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, it's based on Macbeth. So John Turturro is the main character who is actually um, him and his wife, uh, he's a gangster. He's a mafia hitman and uh, his wife sort of set him up more or less, just brought him to, to kill his own boss and become a king, become a boss. And, and then, and, and it's all based on Shakespeare. It's based on Macbeth. So um, these two are great. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of shadow that I can go into, which I want. Maybe one day we'll talk about the shadow uh, just because I don't want the, to give the viewers the wrong impression. So um, I think I'll stop here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for accepting the challenge here, because I know if you're anything like me, and, and I think some t in in regards to film and story, you are. I mean, literally, dude, we could we could sit here until 2022 nonstop and just keep talking about movies and films and actors and actresses and plots and themes and and score and the impact on the masculine and the spiritual journey. And that's that's why I was so just so excited when you invited me uh, to come back to do this with you with this topic. Because again, um, everybody loves movies. I, I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever met somebody who doesn't like movies on some level. Yeah. Now people like different movies for different reasons. 
And that's the beauty of film. There's something for everybody, but it, it really is about story. It comes back to story. Yeah. And this is what for me, and I, you know, knowing you as I do, uh, that dedication, that intention to go into not only my story for me, as you do for yourself, but also to understand other people's stories as you relate to them in your own story, as I relate to them in mine, as I look in the rear view mirror and see what happened in my story, as I deal with myself right now in the present as a 58 year old man, as I dream about what's to come in, in the years to come, there's always a place where I can sit with a movie and meet myself whether it's a little boy or the man I am, the young man I was, the man I want to be sometimes, mm -hmm. the man I long to be. Because um, he's I inside mean, you. Yeah. If you want to be yeah. somebody, there's a reason. God in movies. I, I God talks to me through movies. Movies, yeah. are, movies are a spiritual experience for me, but it, it, it really does come to back to story. And... Um, I believe this. I believe it's true for me as well for you. I, I have a story worth living because I've been given a story worth living. And um, man, thank thank God for the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yes. And um, I guess we should wrap it up. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, there's always going to be things that you want to mention, but um, I'm going to stop here. Is when I was about six or seven, there was this comic book that comic book magazine and there was a story, illustrated story of somebody called Bilbo who, who had an adventure with some ring. And that's when it began for me. So I was, later I read the book and then when the movies came out, I just spoke to me so much in the nature. And the, so anyway, Lord of the Rings, but to me, that's not a film that I keep returning to. It's more archetypal in many ways. So Absolutely. I have seasons for it. Seasons that I would watch it and seasons that I won't watch it for years. Um, yes. So that's definitely. You, you and I could talk about that trilogy again for a long time, and it's fascinating because um, I'm actually rereading the Lord of the Rings again, the book, which is an epic journey in and of itself to read what Tolkien wrote physically as a, as three books yes. in, into one. And I, I agree with you; those those films are seasonal for me. Um, in, in my spiritual and masculine journey, there's always a time where I pull those films out with intention to go back. And I, I, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen that trilogy um, to rediscover the characters, to re reorientate myself in the story, the archetypes in there, um, and, and get lost within the scope of how epic that story is, which really, all of our stories are epic. If, if, if I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm, your story's epic, my story's epic, everybody's story is epic. Yes. If I take a step or three or 12 back and look at my story, man, it is epic. Mm. It doesn't have to be made into a movie, but it's epic none the, nonetheless. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, what the journey has brought me to through film. And man, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see it. It's one, one final thought for me is it's, it's interesting right now with the pandemic that cinemas are actually hurting and struggling. And there's a, there's a real danger now with all the technology that the actual physicality of going into a movie house to sit and watch a movie has literally changed and in some ways is in danger. And again, I, I enjoy film on, on whatever medium I can, but um, I, I hope that we as a culture don't ever lose that opportunity to have the movie house itself to go to because in a way it, it is like a church. It's like a cathedral. Yeah. Um, go in and not, not in a negative connotation way to worship what's on the screen, but to, to look at something bigger than ourselves, the story on the size of the screen 
and to be impacted by the heart, which is really always the story itself, the script of the movie, uh, what, the, what the actors are telling through the story. I, I really pray that we don't lose that in whatever form or fashion in the United Kingdom, here in the States, in little towns and, you know, tiny theaters, wherever they are, or big cineplexes, you know, where you got the fancy seats and everything. But I, I hope we don't lose that capacity to enjoy film in, in that form or fashion. So I'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, John, this has been great. I never expected anything less, actually. I just, I knew it would be hard to, for both of us to, to actually get off the soapboxes and say, okay, that's enough. But I guess we need to wrap it up for now, for now. <laughs> for now, and let me, let me just say, um, it is a joy to my heart. Uh, to have been invited to the men's corner on, on several occasions now. Uh, I'll say it this way. Uh, the door to my heart's always open to the men's corner. Whatever you want to talk about with me about the spiritual and masculine journey, George, you are always welcome to uh, give me the call and I would be honored to answer it. And yeah, we have more conversations about many more topics to have. So I, I hope your listeners and mine and your viewers and mine uh, whoever they may be, small, large, in between, uh, get what they need from these conversations, the podcast, the video podcast. And uh, it's a joy. It's a blast. It's a privilege. So thank you. Appreciate it. Mm, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming on, brother. Thank you. <laughs>